So the last speaker before our keynote is going to be James Mollison. Uh, he's completing his master's degree at Loyola Marymount University in history of philosophy, where he also received his bachelor's. His research interests are the French reception of Nietzsche, more specifically Nietzsche's aestheticization of the subject. Far from being politically and ethically suspect is where Nietzsche's political application proves most fruitful. He has also been occupied with the liberal politics of rights recognition um, founded within the Christian tradition of transcendence, which raises questions about what imminent politics would look like. He has published articles in, on the critique of ideology, on Foucault's romanticization of the Iranian Revolution, and on the application of Foucault and Butler to performances of Macbeth in Northern Irish prisons. So uh, without further ado, James Mollison. I kind of wish I had a truncated introduction. It was just like, James is going to talk, and his, uh, his speech will be nebulous. Um, <laughs> so that self-depreciation comes from the fact that I'm presenting on um, George Bataille. So hopefully you'll forgive me the crime of reading my presentation. But when dealing with someone as confusing as Bataille, um, I want to be as precise as possible in my word choice. I also hope you forgive me for not being here yesterday. Um, but if you don't want to, you can frame all of your questions in terms of a conversation that was had yesterday. And I will be incapable of uh, hanging in there. <laughs> so my, my paper, I guess, attempts to provide a primer on some of the large picture philosophic issues that Bataille is engaging with through his analysis of violent laughter, the experience of violent laughter. Stuart Kendall provides one of the most succinct encapsulations of Bataille's thought in his introduction to his translation of the book Guilty. And there he writes, quote, Bataille explores religious experience without God, philosophy without knowledge, anthropology without society, psychology without a self, and poetry beyond expression. It is a modern via negativa, life beyond utility, end quote. But unfortunately, such brevity has the unintended consequence of reducing the complexity of Bataille's thought to a mere iconoclasm, which encourages his dismissal. Um, in turn, iconoclastic reductions lend themselves to facile readings that caricature Bataille, and they render him something as a joke. So my contention is that this is the right conclusion to be drawn, but in the majority of cases, it's arrived at for the wrong reasons. Um, so contrary to the indictment of Bataille that you see in thinkers as disparate as Richard Volin or Slavo Žižek, or to the implicit dismissal of Bataille by his complete absence from discussions of contemporary French philosophy in a lot of departments, I simply want to argue that Bataille should be given due hearing as someone that is addressing serious problems within the Western philosophic tradition um, by considering his treatment of laughter. And I think that that treatment is much in alignment with some of the previous speakers, um, because I think Bataille's attempt at appropriating laughter is an attempted uh, Nietzschean affirmation within the philosophic tradition in spite of profound difficulties inherent within philosophy's ambitions. Um, so with that being said, let me go through, I guess, uh, how Bataille uses laughter in his treatment of philosophy writ large, and then how that informs his positive view of knowledge, ethics, and religion. So first, uh, the epistemological implications of an experience of violent laughter. So while Bataille has several essays on the subject of laughter, I'd like to focus on the essay, Non-Knowledge, Laughter, and Tears, from the appropriately named Unfinished System of Non-Knowledge. Um, surprisingly, this is his most contained, independent, and conclusive work on the subject of laughter. In this essay, Bataille suggests that laughter is integral to understanding his thought insofar as it's philosophical. To quote him, he says, my philosophy is a philosophy of laughter. It is a philosophy founded on the experience of laughter, and it does not even claim to go farther than that, end quote. So this association of laughter and philosophy is not a personal eccentricity on Bataille's part. Rather, Bataille believes that laughter must be examined because it seems to quote, that to resolve the problem of laughter and to resolve the philosophic problem is the same thing, end quote. So following this line of reasoning, I want to investigate the problem of laughter, what it presents to philosophy, and then ask in what sense this problem is emblematic of philosophy's essential task. So laughter presents the problem of non-knowledge to philosophy, and this is not to say that laughter cannot be studied or known. On the contrary, Bataille contends that laughter is easily observed, it's easily defined, and reproduced. But nonetheless, he asks whether, because we know how to laugh, or when we laugh, we can say that we truly understand what is laughable. Indeed, on closer reflection, it seems impossible for us to imagine a phenomenology of laughter 
that would account for laughter's being at the same time as a lived experience of violent laughter. And Bataille elaborates on this point by way of a pun on reflection. So, a quotation. We perceive nothing of laughter's being <clears throat> other than a reflection, and the reflection is disconcerted. The origin of laughter, to someone who reflects on it, is given from the outside. It is an objective given clearly detached from the subjective response, since we can e easily recognize that a comical element causes us to laugh, but not why it makes us laugh. A link in the chain that brings the subject to the object seems to be missing. And that's the end of the quotation. So this missing link recalls those awkward moments where you can identify what has made you laugh, but not why, to the people around you. And uh, people have spoken to that, I guess, different um, context, whether cultural, or I guess intellectual degrees, which is a fun context for laughter. That means um, there's a discrepancy where you can't explain why you were laughing to someone else. But even if we were to retroactively identify the why of our laughter, this is still dissatisfactory for Bataille. Such an approach concedes the need for philosophy to account for the experience of laughter, but it fails to address the experiential dimension that is central to his inquiry. This experience mustn't be neglected, like tears, like ecstasy, like sacrifice, and like communication, the experience of laughter somehow expresses what Bataille calls, quote, the given behind philosophy. So what's this given? Well, to address it, Bataille asks that we shift our approach. Rather than assuming that, assuming that laughter is unknown, he asks that we assume laughter is unknowable. To quote him, in other words, the unknowable character of the laughable would not be accidental, but essential. We would not laugh for a reason that we did not happen to know for lack of information, but because the unknown makes us laugh." End quote. So it's in this sense that laughter reveals the problem of philosophy, because it shows us, and here's a, another lengthy quotation, um, that superficial appearances conceal a perfect lack of response to our anticipation. We see that finally, given the exercise of knowledge, the world is likewise situated completely out of the reach of this exercise, and that even, no, I'm sorry, and even that, not only the world, but also the being that we are, is somehow out of our reach. There is in us and in the world something that reveals that knowledge was not given to us, and that situates itself uniquely as being unable to be attained by knowledge. This, it seems to me, is that in which we lack." End quotation. So this raises many ambiguities. Um, and for me, the most interesting one is the status of this something that is beyond our reach, the unknown, or the unknowable, rather. The question I ask is whether this is a merely negative epistemological limit, or is it an object with a positive ontological status? Um, there's a joke from Mitch Hedberg. I don't know if anyone likes that guy. Good comedian. But the, the joke is about um, Bigfoot. And he says, I think the problem is that Bigfoot is blurry. It's not the camera guy's fault. Um, and I think that's actually apropos in this instance, right? So the question is, is the unknowable something that is ambiguous by virtue of our lack of epistemological capacity, or is it just intrinsically ambiguous? And so the ambiguity that we see is like a, an objective expression of the Bigfoot, the unknowable, within the time. Um, but for now, I think we should be content with just suggesting that this ambiguity is, seems endemic to whatever the unknowable is. So to recapitulate before moving on to more positive things, in examining our experience of laughter, Philosophy discovers a missing link between the laughing subject and the laughable character of an ob object or an experience. And this missing link defies the essential function of philosophy, and that function is to link our being to that of the world through knowledge. Our experience of the unknown is thus synonymous with the problem to which philosophy must respond. Accordingly, Bataille seeks to establish a positive system of knowledge, a tragicomic ethics, and a mystical theory of religion, all structured around a sort of fidelity to those events in which the unknown is experienced. So keeping in mind that artificially separating out these intertwined areas of philosophy as well as ethics and religion and how separating them will be a bit confusing, I want to consider them individually. So first, uh, laughter and positive knowledge. You should note that Bataille has a profoundly cynical view of the history of philosophy. Concerning the repeated attempts to resolve skepticism, concerning thought's relation to the world, Bataille writes, quote, Philosophers succeeding each other resemble the inveterate gambler who has always lost, but is no less sure that he will win the next time." End quote. Beginning with Socrates, every thinker in the Western philosophic tradition seems to demonstrate the inadequacy of the intellectual project hitherto, only to be criticized in turn by the next generation. Another lengthy quotation. Humankind received intelligence in part, only to be infinitely sworn to idiocy. 
the most intelligent humans have only succeeded in demonstrating some intelligence, and a little later, their efforts were judged, just as they themselves judged the effort, efforts of their predecessors. Finally, it was only a question of adding a name on the list of honors at the most funeral distribution of prizes. You publish books, they're skeptical, they're critical. It's a great prize. Um, so this reality is what Bataille designates with the term non-knowledge, which will be important. It's like the unknowable. So crucially, non-knowledge denotes not a failure on the part of an individual thinker, but an essential relationship between thought and ignorance. Thought, categorically, is an effect of ignorance. It's an effect of our lack of knowledge for Bataille. That's why we are thinking. So all knowledge is the result, I guess, um, of, of this essential link. All knowledge is essential, um, I'm sorry, is essentially insofar that we have knowledge that we are sl slidden back into this sort of ignorance, into nothing. All knowledge slides towards nothingness. It is suspended in and by the unknowable. And while we may possess knowledge in a relative sense or in a compartmentalized sense, in an absolute sense, we're ignorant. So as a student of Kojev, Kohev, I'm not sure, ignorant. Um, Bataille holds a view of negation that, if not determinate in the Hegelian sense, is at least much more complex than a mere exclusion of opposites. And in the context of laughter, as an effect of the transition from knowledge to non-knowledge, laughter is the effect of non-knowledge, but that doesn't mean that we accept the idea that we know nothing by the fact that we laugh. Rather, to quote Bataille again, someone who laughs in principle does not abandon his science, but refuses to accept it for a while, for a limited time. They let themselves pass beyond it through a movement of laughter, so that what they know is destroyed, but in our depths, we preserve the conviction that just the same, it isn't destroyed. Someone who laughs preserves deep within them what laughter suppresses, but that it is only suppressed artificially, if you will. Likewise, laughter has the ability to suspend our very closed logics. In fact, when we are in this domain, we are just as able to preserve our beliefs without believing in them, and reciprocally, we can know that which we simultaneously destroy as known. So a useful means of interpreting a passage such as this is the description of Bataille as an inverted Hegelian. Um, and so he's striving to move from knowledge toward a sort of imminent, absolute experience that you might call beneath sense certainty. So an imminent experience that would preclude knowledge, such as laughter. So concerning the controversies around absolute knowing in Hegel's phenomenology, where in some contend that absolute knowing is achievable um, and that it's static, and others contend that absolute knowing is more of an unattainable regulative ideal, or that it's only attained in realizing that the dialectic is never finished, Bataille is closer to one of the latter options. Um, laughter is a kind of quasi-sublation where knowledge is negated, surpassed, and maintained in a regressive descent toward imminent experience of the unknowable. However, that experience isn't final. We sort of slide back from these imminent moments into knowledge claims, albeit compartmentalized and limited. Um, so again, the, the image of the inverted Hegelian, I think is really useful in unpacking Bataille. Uh, short of absolute knowing, we have to take all of our other truth claims as being provisional, and so limited knowledge is absolutely lacking. Um, it's, our limited knowledge claims are sort of in the void. But this enables us to appreciate Spataille's linking of the experience of non-knowledge to, quote, um, a kind of necessity toward positive philosophy, end quote. So although positive philosophy is suspended, if you will, within laughter, the, ver the voracious pursuit of this limit is the mark of all great systems of thought. In this spirit, Bataille evokes a line from Goethe's Conversations with Eckerman. Um, quote, man was not born to resolve the problems of the universe, but to discover where the problems originate, and then to maintain himself within the limits of the intelligible, end quote. However, pursuing such limits risks rushing against the unknown or the unknowable, which may inspire ecstasy, it may inspire tears, or laughter. And it's in this sense that Bataille contends that there is no distinction between laughing at a thing and possessing its truth. Laughter, as an effect of non-knowledge, marks the limit of a thing's intelligibility, and thus demarcates a sort of negative backdrop that is necessary for positive epistemological content. Yet at the same time, laughter asks that we suspend this positive knowledge within a claim of absolute ignorance. Now, of course, this can be directed back against Bataille's account, right, that it's ultimately futile. But in response, Bataille would contend that his work possesses a certain dignity that, quote, can only be attained on one condition, that of first having been to the end of the possibilities of knowing. It is only beyond knowledge, perhaps in the non-knowledge that Bataille presents, that we would have the right to conquer our own ignorance. So while we're right to describe all philosophic systems as sort of 
futile and thus a bit comic, only Bataille's unfinished system of non-knowledge is laughing at itself. So I want to talk about the ethical implications of, uh, of I guess, non-knowledge, of the unknowable. So that the philosophic project emanates from an essential condition of ignorance, and that philosophy slides into this ignorance upon realizing the inaccessible nature of absolute knowledge, these pessimistic claims are easier to accept than Bataille's suggestion that we actively pursue ignorance in a hope of imminent and ecstatic experience. Indeed, this claim seems to be an unlivable form of nihilism. And against this, I'd like to suggest that closer consideration of Bataille shows that his, um, he does have an ethical paradigm, in short. It's not in the Kantian sense of a prescriptive program of how to behave, but more in the Aristotelian sense of addressing how we should live in light of the tragic limitations of our knowledge. And what's more is it seems that laughter is crucial in this capacity, that it informs something like the tragicomic affirmation of life and knowledge in spite of our essential finitude. So initially, note that Bataille pursues laughter in an attempt to overcome a sense of futility and resignation that may result from the incessant slide from knowledge back to the unknown. The desired effect is one in which, quote, thought stops the movement that subordinates it, and laughing identifies with the rupture of those bonds that had formerly subordinated it, end quote. So this shift where thought ceases identifying with knowledge and instead identifies with the unceasing slide toward ignorance is a sovereign moment. It's closely related to Bataille's notions of inner, inner experience as well as summit morality. And as a sovereign moment, laughter is not the means for anything else. Rather, it has intrinsic instead of instrumental value. And accordingly, it's a strange kind of success. Um, our concern is lifted when we laugh. And granted, to instrumental thought, laughter would seem pointless. But to comic thought, to the summit morality, um, the summit morality is indifferent to this sort of judgment, I suppose. In laughter, nothing is left but a feeling of triumph that ce celebrates a marriage of power and loss, of divinity and, and impotence, of knowledge and ignorance. So this might explain why we would rejoice in something that puts the life or puts our lives in danger, the equilibrium of our knowledge in danger. It does not explain how laughter um, elicited by an experience of non-knowledge is ethical in any sense. In fact, appeals to imminent ecstasy only make laughter appear more self-serving. So it's in this context that we should note that Bataille emphasizes, contrary to common experience, that his experience of laughter entails a joy that, quote, cannot be separated from a tragic feeling. And here it becomes quite apparent that Bataille is also very much in the strains of Nietzscheanism that we've been talking about um, all day. So this brings us to a passage from The Will to Power, which Bataille considers to be the source of his affinity with Nietzsche. And it reads, to see tragic nature's founder and to be able to laugh despite feelings of profound understanding, emotion, and sympathy, which are also felt, that is what it means to be divine. So the emphasis placed on sympathetic understanding prevents us from interpreting this passage as a call for malice or contemptuous laughter, and instead suggests an ethical qualification of laughter, that laughter is only triumphant in the face of personally experiencing the tragic. In the context of philosophy, that means that to identify with that which ruptures thought and to transvalue failure, we must first pursue the philosophic project in earnest as a condition for a tragicomic experience of its limits. Bataille emphasizes that the experience of non-knowledge cannot be dissociated from an expression like this one, from Nietzsche's expression. While non-knowledge has the capacity to elicit tears as well as laughter, in the moment that we laugh when faced with the tragic, quote, everything is lightened, everything is simple, and everything could be said without any kind of painful accent, without any call to emotions other than emotions that have already been overcome, end quote. So the futility of the philosophic project isn't altered at all in this, but when we laugh, our thought is connected to a dominant position where it affirms the, the slide into ignorance. Um, quoting Bataille again, the most timid laughter absorbs infinite weakness, end quote. So the limitless strength found in laughter marks the ability to transvalue the slide into the unknown with a sort of affirmation. And far from being a sign of nihilist resignation and self-interest, laughter thus affords the ability to persist in the face of tragic failure, to affirm life in an incessant slide toward nothingness. On one level, Bataille's account of laughter thus places a positive accent on the truth that philosophy will never be complete, that it, that is, that it is essentially unfinished. But on another level, the pursuit of non-knowledge is an imminent and unknowable experience that also risks being brought to tears each time we laugh. But Bataille voraciously pursues this affective affect of non-knowledge, and in so doing, opens himself up to an unconditional intensity that is the precursor for all affectation and for all empathy. So I uh, now want to switch into laughter and religion, which is where things get increasingly interesting, because um, Bataille is like a quasi-mystic. And so he, I, I think he 
not romanticizes, but mysticizes the unknowable. Um, and that has interesting ontological and theological implications. So lastly, let's consider last four major works, the Atheological Summa. Bataille the often appears to be profoundly religious. Um, his emphasis on the unknowable and on inner imminent experience, in fact, suggests that his religiousness resembles a mixture of negative theology and mysticism. But how does laughter fit into this first? Um, so laughter informs Bataille's religious beliefs in much the same way that it informs his view of philosophy. The experience of laughter sus surpasses and suspends faith, but it does not require that we stop believing altogether, keeping in mind the negation. <coughs> Quote, I was able to recover in myself all the movements of religious experience and to confound them with the experience of laughter without feeling this religious experience was impoverished as a result, end quote. So this is a reminder of the Hegelian influence on Bataille's view of negation. But beyond this, there's a clear sense in which the experience of the unknown is prioritized over traditional modes of religion. Quoting him again, it's entirely in the act of posing being as a problem for myself, being as completely unknown, and throwing myself into this lack of understanding that I discover an experience not only as rich as religious experience, but it seems to me even richer, more profound, if that's possible, end quote. So the comparative claim about the profundity of experiencing the unknown stems from Bataille's association of imminence with the sacred. Colloquial religious expressions or experiences can be motivated by the isolated fact that we suffer and that fear governs our actions. Um, and both suffering and fear lend themselves to instrumental future-oriented considerations and Bataille thinks that these are profane. And instead, he would like an experience of non-knowledge um, that is entirely detached from anxiety over the future. And that would mean also an experience that slides from discrete identities into rupture. So this experience of non-knowledge is comparable to mystical and negative theology, as I alluded to. Um, Bataille clarifies, however, that the experience of the unknown is distinct from negative theology in that it is, quote, not only negative within certain limits, but totally negative, end quote. This absolute negativity is what Bataille calls atheology, and he expresses it in a befuddling proposition um, that, quote, God is the effect of non-knowledge. Though as an effect of non-knowledge, God is always knowable, like laughter and like the sacred, end quote. This seems to be part of Bataille's mysticism, and rather than adopt the apophatic proposition that God is unknowable, Bataille instead reduces God to an effect of the unknowable, which is in some sense more primary than the divine. Um, so now I'd like to return to the, the Bigfoot, the ambiguity regarding whether the unknowable is an epistemological limit or an ontological entity, which I think is the, the cool part. Um, so far from being pedestrian, Bataille's references to the divine assume the full ontotheological implications of God that we would expect from a medievalist by training who also had formerly considered joining the priesthood. Accordingly, Bataille's claim that the unknown is prior to God should be placed within the context of the Western philosophic tradition. And insofar as being is co-determinate with what can be known, to say the unknown is prior to God is to say non-knowledge supersedes being. So here's a, a shaky recipe, but hopefully it'll start a conversation. Take the apophatic theological premise that God is unknowable. And it's irrelevant whether this is because, because God contains all predicates regardless of their contrariety, or if it's because God is a pure unity, cannot be thought, but is the condition for all thought. Just Let's just assume that God is unknowable. And to this, add the premise that things exist by participating in God, or if you prefer, Plotinus' argument about the identity of imminence and transcendence. From these, we can gesture toward a Bataillan notion that the unknown is imminently operative in all things, that all things have a, a secret, that's it, a secret within them. Um, this is a mystical emphasis on personal experience. We need to put that in there as well. Um, and that's a rough outline of Bataille's pursuit of the inner limit of the self as an attempt to reveal that identity is an effect of the unknowable. So while philosophically I compared Bataille to an inverted Hegel, theologically I think you could compare him to a Spinoza of the void, or an atheological pantheist. He considers all things sacred insofar as the unknowable secret resides in the heart of their identities. I normally would write off the conclusion um, because it's recapitulative, but because I think things are kind of dodgy and a little shaky, I'm going to summarize. Hopefully it'll help. So it may seem that Bataille's work amounts to one large appeal to ignorance, to whatever lies outside of knowledge. But the rejoinder that I think Bataille would have is that his work is an appeal to experience. Without warning, the unknowable cuts into and disrupts our thought and our lives in experiences like violent laughter. That's the experience I've considered. It's a kind of aftershock of a more fundamental experience that is the experience of the unknowable. 
in the, in the face of this, there's a real risk that we will be resigned to a tragic sense of futility, that philosophy will become laughable. But in response, Bataille provides a program for not only voraciously pursuing the unknowable, but also for transvaluing our sense of insufficiency along philosophy's limits. Non-knowledge is the condition for thought. It's also the condition for empathetic solidarity, and also the condition for faith in the sacred. The lack of foundation can cause either tragic despair or, with the aid of laughter, it can become a source of inspiration. Laughter as an effect of non-knowledge accordingly inspires the philosophic, ethical, and theological projects, theological projects, affirming the way thought will never reach an ultimate resolution, that tragedy and comedy share a hidden affinity that is also the source of empathy, and also that everything is sacred. Thank you. Again, we're right on time. We have about 10 minutes for questions for, for James. I'm impressed. <laughs> Wait. So, I have a question about the status of the unknowable. It makes me think of what's his name, Rumsfeld, you know, with his known knowns and none of it. So, like the mystic unknowable is like a known unknown, right? The mystic knows that God is there, but it's unknown. It sounds like the tie is the, like, an unknown. Sure, like what exactly is for him the status of the unknowable? It's not the not yet known, it's, but it's not an unknown that we know we're not going to get to. Is it that unknown? unknown so, so I um I don't want to make any appeals to Donald Rose, <laughs> but I think it's closer to the unknown unknown. Um, so you you sort of have the the, the problem that we've been skirting around earlier today, um, the Nietzschean problem, right, where he says, all is interpretation, and then immediately follows it with, surely you will say that too is, is but an interpretation, and then he says, so much the better. And so there's this sort of moment where he's acknowledging that his position is a little bit self-effacing, but it inspires, I think, a, a critical eye in the part of the reader. Um, it ties up to something similar. So he acknowledges that to even say the unknowable is, is to present a, a, a litany of problems, but he doesn't seem to think that that is performatively inconsistent, but rather evidence, like performative um, proof of our inability to even discuss it, right? So yes, it is contradictory to say the unknowable is flat out. That is evidence to the effect that we can't even begin to talk about it. Um, in Inner Experience, he has this, this wonderful quotation uh, that poetry is a holocaust of words, but I think that the unknowable is that as well. It's, it's what inspires either sort of reverent silence um, or endless speaking. And that, we're back at Plotinus. So Plotinus says about you know, the, the ultimate unity, you either talk ad infinitum or you, you say nothing. And for Bataille, there's a lot of passages where he's, he's going on strange diatribes and ramblings, and then he puts in ellipses where you would expect like a conclusion. Um, and there's also a lot of advocacies for for sacred silence, um, for moments where the philosopher finds themselves incapable of talking. And I think whatever that exterior is, the, what is the thing at which I am at a loss to even talk about, um, that's, that's really inspiring. I think it drives philosophy in a really interesting way. The short answer is I don't, I don't think your question can be answered without me talking for another life. <laughs> like this isn't, I, I like to compartmentalize problems as like articles and then there's dissertations and then there's books and then there's careers. Um, that's like a career large question. It's like, because to even begin approaching it is to illustrate the futility of the approach. So a quick, so is this is silence and like kind of anarchy of words, what was that phrase you used to say? No, Holocaust of words. Holocaust of words. Bergson has some line where he says somewhere every philosopher really just thinks one thought, but the reason they write so much is the incommensurability between that one thought and the means they have at their disposal for expressing it. So they just go on and on. So it's up to choice. You just go on and on where you're silent, but both approaches are aiming at the same thing or however you want to put that. I don't even I'm tempted to say that they're not that different of choices, that that even like the, the point seems to be that to some extent to go on and on is still to say very little. Um, it's, it's hard. I, I immediately have remorse. Like I'm super excited by Bataille. I was thinking during the, the um, 
speech before lunch about uh, epistemic emotions and um, the juxtaposition of, I guess, of insight and like, what was it? It was an orgasm? It was, it was something. So, but Ty's very sexy. Like, I love it. I love reading it, and it drives me to continue researching on it. Um, this is the, probably the fourth time I've presented on Bataille, and I find myself at a loss as soon as I'm discussing it with other people. Um, but it, it is sexy, and it does inspire a great deal of both confusion and curiosity. Um, did, I, did I spark a parallel, please? Uh, no, I was just, just wanted to expand on uh, I think it was the phrase he said was Bataille's like Spinoza and Hegel. Can you unpack that a little bit? So the idea was that <laughs> I don't know. The, the argument was if we, if we assume that a God is unknowable and then that all things exist by virtue of participating in God, that there's something in everything that is unknowable. Um, the, the eye roll doesn't suggest you were happy with that. No, 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 no. Oh, insight. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, there's, it, it's strange because to, to couple it with the Hegelian claim, um, instead of sort of absolute idealism <coughs> moving upward, Bataille is very much striving for what he calls base materialism. So it's reducing even the most absolute and abstract of concepts to their like base matter. Um, and so he, he likes to, to take a philosopher like Hegel and he'll talk about him defecating. Um, and so you see like these moments where even the most abstract ideal of concepts are brought down to inert, ineffable nothingness. And he often talks about why materialism hitherto has failed, that materialism hitherto has been all too idealistic. And so when he says base materialism, he means like inert, in, indiscriminate matter. And that's sort of the, the nothing that might be at the heart of all things. It's reducing a otherwise intelligent gorgeous human being with a great intellectual career to like the moment where they stub their big toe. Um, and there's, that's, it's funny, right? There's something laughable about that where it's, the whole system is just brought down to something very trite. I actually really appreciated the references to Spinoza and Hegel. It was really interesting and I'd like to talk. Uh, but your talk also kind of reminded me of references to radical empiricists such as uh, William James and uh, Whitehead and also the, all these people influenced Deleuze and then I was also reminded of Levinas, his early work on the, the concept of Ilya, Darius, uh, as this empirical field prior to consciousness and prior to um, conceptualization. And I, I noted certain resonance when it comes to the diet, but I don't, I haven't read a lot of the diet, perhaps you could expand on that for us, because I did see some similarities because he is talking about base materialism, um, a pure experience. I, I think the parallel is, is a really interesting one um, and probably certainly worth pursuing. But I also think that um, for Bataille, like the, I guess the observer observed distinction probably isn't going to hold up very well. And so even in the act of making observations about empirical matter, we imbue it with so much that isn't there. Um, that I think he would, he would have a serious problem with it. So if we, um, I don't know, it's, it's sort of like the, the previous comments concerning how all knowledge claims are a mobile army of, of metaphors, but they're, for Bataille, they're much more futile than that. He's like a futilitarian. Um, so <laughs> even the most simple, basic propositional claims will be adding so much to base material that it'll sort of be a non-starter. Um, but he, for, for all that futility, he seems to um, like the, the process more than the end. I don't, I don't know. So he has a, a response to Sartre. So he was, he was presenting a paper um, to Sartre and like Gene Wall and some other really cool people in, in like a living room because he wasn't teaching anywhere. And um, Sartre's response and his review of inner experience is um, that Bataille has capitalized nothingness. That He's made nothingness into a thing. And Bataille's reply, which is published in the back of his book on Nietzsche, is that that would be well and good if the process ever stopped. But he recognizes immediately that his, that his claim is contradictory, faulty, and stupid, and then continues to, to sort of spiral out of control. Um, and that's, it's like a methodological thing that 
that I think is super interesting, and I forgot why I brought it up. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, and uh, maybe maybe you think this would be the wrong way to go, but um, I was wondering if it was possible to tie some of the stuff on laughter back to what what Ty said about general economy. Um, what I'm reminded of is um, a line at the beginning of Twilight of the Idols when he just says, "Excess of strength is the only proof of strength." Right. This idea of an excess, you know, I think of Nietzsche at that point laughing at his at whatever he's conquered, you know, <laughs> and um, the idea of, of laughter as a I like that. Uh, is that, I mean, is that, you said you do like that. I do like that. Okay. Um, um, could you say a little bit more about the notion of general um, Well, so, I, I'm not that big of a fan, well, first, of separating thinkers into like an early, a middle, and a late stage, but secondly, I'm not a fan of middle bataille. Um, so middle bataille is the, the attempt to reconcile base materialism with vaguely Marxist notions, which leads him to the Accursed Share series, right? And so, um, the claim is that all economies are truly founded on sacrifice. And he, he also uses, uses this as like an animating principle. He goes back to like the platonic image of the sun um, and says the sun is just a big burning ball of expenditure that has no purpose and it, it's the source of life. Um, and I think it'd be totally in alignment to say that whatever this sort of um, base, not even instinctual, this this thing underneath us, this drive is, that it takes us over in, mom in moments of laughter, that there's just a pure expenditure of energy, like we heard earlier, that, that laughter does take a certain amount of even physiological energy, right? Um, but it doesn't really go anywhere or do that much. I don't know, it, it can be cathartic, maybe, but if that is instrumentally useful, I don't know about that either. I, I would be very comfortable saying that laughter is an instance of expenditure um, and that would tie right back into the notion of general economy as opposed to restrictive economy. There's there's no need to like maintain efficiency when laughing. <laughs> yeah. Nice, that's cool. Um, I'm I'm surprised that, that I'm not like getting more confused and disgruntled books. <laughs> that's nice.